Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to my talk on making, releasing, and selling an indie game made in Python. Uh, thank you to PyCon for having me. Oh, I meant to say bonjour. I've ruined it from the very first word. But um, uh, I'm very excited to be here. Uh, I'm Dodgyville on most of the important websites on the internet. Uh, you can get my contact details from any of the major security leaks of the last five years, you know, Harpleed, NSA, or the Sony PlayStation credit card leak. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about uh, my game design aims. Uh, uh, I'm going to use PyVita, my engine, to make a point-and-click adventure game, a very small one, because we've got a lot to get through. I'm going to talk about releasing a game and publicizing it. I thought I'd start by introducing my games. Uh, my main one is My Ex-Boyfriend, The Space Tyrant, uh, and I'm working on a second one called Escape from Pleasure Planet. Uh, uh, my Ex-Boyfriend, The Space Tyrant is a 2D point-and-click adventure, a la LucasArts and Telltale. Uh, inspirations were Day of the Tentacle, Space Quest, and Sam and Max. Back to the Future, but that's 3D. Uh, the science fiction adventure, uh, so the inspirations were Star Trek The Next Generation, Doctor Who, and uh, Space 1999. And if any of you have seen that show and like it, please come and talk to me about it, because I've never met anybody else that is, you know, loves that show as much as I do. Uh, these are screenshots, by the way, to give you an idea of what it looks like. Uh, they're gay-themed, and if you haven't figured that out by now, uh, now's your time. Uh, the inspirations are Priscilla, Queen of the Desert, and Australian gay culture, and that's caused a bit of a kerfuffle sometimes overseas, because uh, uh, Australian gay culture is quite camp and kitsch, comparatively. You know, uh, and it was released in December 2012 as a digital download, and in it you play as Captain Tycho Minogue, brought out of retirement to face an invasion fleet led by your ex-boyfriend. Uh, it's non-pornographic, it's a serious attempt at a commercial game, and it's been paying the rent, so I've been very lucky. So that was the who, where, what, and when. The why I made it is because growing up, there was a lack of same-sex love interest in the science fiction that I loved. Uh, about the closest I got was in one of the Foundation books, where, uh, I think Foundation and Earth, where the main character goes down to this icy planet and his ship gets impounded, and to get it out, he has to sleep with the Minister of Security. And she's a beautiful woman, but Asimov is at pains to point out how manly she is. And, uh, you know, so there wasn't much I had growing up. Uh, so I picked a point-and-click adventure game because a gay theme implies a gay story and point-and-click genre is great for narrative and it's uh, event-driven, not time-driven, so people play it at their own pace. And I thought that would be a good idea because m in my mind, the target audience were gay men who maybe once every five years play a Zelda or a Civilization. And I picked Disney-style Disney graphics uh, because you know, a lot of people are afraid of computer games and they're afraid of gay content. And so I thought by making it non-threatening and fun, it would lend itself to comedy but it also maximized its chance for success. Uh, but before we go any further and break game design down into its components, I'd like to say that I think, in my opinion, game design is a craft, and you want all the components working together all the time. So you want the artistic side and the technical side and the business side uh, always to be meshed together, working all the time. So you can't just do the art and then come up with a game, and you can't just make a game and then go, oh, how do I sell this? You know, at every step of the process, you've got to ask, is this artistic? Is this technical, uh, technically competent? You know, can I sell this? Can I market it? Uh, so I'm going to keep coming back to that idea that it's, it's a whole process rather than just one individual thing. So we'll get to Python code in a couple of minutes, but I just thought I'd point, I just sort of mentioned that the actual code is just a small part of the overall process of making and selling a game. So what should indie game developers aim for when they're making a game? Well, I think, first of all, they should aim to make entertaining games. Now, when I first made this slide, I had fun. But as an indie developer, compared to larger studios, you have some advantages and you have some disadvantages. Uh, one advantage you have is that at a conceptual stage, you get to, be, you get to think outside the box and you know, really push the boundary a bit. So you don't need to make a fun game. You know, a, a horror game doesn't need to be fun, or a sad game doesn't need to be fun. But at some level, they all need to be entertaining. So how do you make a game entertaining? Well, we talk about gameplay, and that's sometimes a nebulous concept. Uh, but if you play or make games long enough, you sometimes can detect that they have a bit of a beat. Uh, and they, so, you know, as a developer, you're in charge of that beat. Uh, you, games also have high points and low points, and you want to maximize the high points and minimize the low points, uh, the number and the duration of them. And you want to do it as soon as possible, because the later you get in the process, the harder and harder it is to remove the, the dull spots. And I speak from personal experience, because in My Ex-Boyfriend, The Space Tyrant, about half an hour into the game, there is a, is a really dead spot where you have to walk between a castle and a field about three times. And every time I watch someone play the game, 
Uh, they get to that point, and it's death to them. It's just terrible. And I feel bad about it, but oh well. Uh, so how can you make your gameplay entertaining? Well, a simple way is reward for effort. So if you kill the Swamp Rat, you get five gold coins. Uh, but if you kill the queen of the Swamp Rats, you give them 5,000 gold coins uh, and maybe a cutscene. Uh, that's a basic example. Uh, if you want to get even a little bit more technical about it, you can consider your gameplay in terms of push and pull factors. So what's pushing a player through the game and what's pulling them through the game? So an example of a push factor could be a wall of fire that's slowly advancing through the level. An example of a pull factor could be something as simple as an open door in the distance, because people always tend to like to see what's over the horizon. Another way you can streamline your game and make it more entertaining is to focus on making your controls and interface as polished as possible. An example from my ex-boyfriend, The Space Tyrant, was that uh, there's an inventory system. So, and when you clicked on it, keeping in mind the artistic side, I had this beautiful animation where the inventory swooped up and then swooped down. And one of the testers came to me and he goes, it feels like a bit of a drag to use the inventory. I don't like it when there's an inventory puzzle. And so I replaced all that lovely animation with just a simple pop-up, pop-down, and instantly the game felt snappier and lighter and faster. And so you've just really got to kind of you know, focus on the gameplay to make an entertaining game. Something else I think game makers need to focus on is quality. Uh, your game must be polished. Uh, and how do you achieve that? Well, bug-free, and that's easier said than done. You want to make a complete game, so you don't want half-finished levels or dead ends or anything like that. And you also want the menus to be polished, and that sounds like something that's not so important, but it's really that kind of polish, that crossing the T's and dotting the I's, that elevate a game from an amateur game to a professional game, and a professional game is something that you can sell. And the other thing I think we need to focus on as part of quality is making the game good-looking. I know in the open source movement, we sometimes struggle with the aesthetic side of software, but uh, you, know, if you, make, you can make a great game, but if it doesn't look good, no one, not very few people will want to play it. Uh, so don't bother coming to the party if you're not prepared to put in the resources to make your game good looking. And I think, finally, what game developers should focus on when they make their game is making an interesting game. And it must be interesting to other people. And that ties into the marketing publicity side of making a game. And we often think of those as dirty words, uh, but they're really just tools for putting the game in front of people who will find it interesting. And uh, it's only a dirty process when you put it in front of people who have no interest in it at all, because then you're scamming them of their time. Uh, one thing to consider when making an interesting game is there's a difference between making something people want versus what they will want. And because we're in Canada, I'll come up with a Canadian example. Uh, a lot of people want zombie games. So if you're a Canadian developer, maybe you'll make a Canadian zombie game. Uh, and putting those two games in front of a Canadian gamer, they may gravitate towards the Canadian zombie game instead of the, the generic zombie game. Uh, whether that, and that's because you've made something they will want, not necessarily something they want. But whether that is profitable for you is the business decision you have to make. So applying the dog food test to my game, is it entertaining? Well, I mentioned the dead spot about half an hour in. That's a learning experience for me. The point and click genre is a mixed bag. It has a reputation for being a bit slow, uh, and you've just got to kind of mitigate that sometimes. I, worked at that by making a comedy. If you can't afford explosions and things like that, put in a joke. People often remember it just as much. Uh, there's a tip system to help you when you get stuck. You can get help from the system, and it'll tell you where to go. That's really important in a point and click. Uh, it, it can be frustrating in an FPS to have your uh, spawn location camped by a sniper, but that's nothing compared to the frustration of not being able to put the fish in the bucket, which is so often in point and click adventure games. Yes. Uh, is it quality? Well, I thought it was a complete package with a few rough edges. And is it interesting? Well, it has been quite compelling for, for gay men, the target audience, and it was quite compelling for the press. I have two slides coming up on that. So let's make a game using my engine, uh, PyVita. It's just a small one. So the first step is to write your own adventure. Uh, in this example, we'll just use a really quick one. Tycho enters the foyer. There's a guard at the door. There's a steady drip from a small crack in the dome. You widen the crack, it causes a flood. The guard leaves his post to plug the crack, so the door's unguarded. Then you can go inside and destroy the machine. So already you should be asking yourself, is this entertaining? Is this quality? Is it interesting? Can I sell it? You bake it in at every level. But for the purposes today, we'll make do. So my engine, the basics of PyVita is simplicity to use it, constant feedback to the designer so they know what's happening, and it you know, runs like a tank because it's going on all those computers. Uh, and adventure games can really be made using ba six basic sort of uh, fun interactions, like looking at something, interacting with something, using an item on another item, saying things, going places, and doing things. 
Uh, with PyVita, I really tried to bring a stage play mentality to the process. I always think of, you know, art house directors. Uh, would they ever make a computer game version of their art house film? And so they'd go into the room with the developers, and the developers would say, well, the first thing you need to do is load up your background resource. You know, those people would just turn around and walk out of the room. Uh, but if you abstract it up into this sort of stage play idea, conceptually, it's a lot easier to deal with. And, you know, we get it too. Uh, and when you go with a stage play mentality, it laps, overlaps very well with a test-driven mentality. If you think of a play as something that's written first and then you act it, whereas with test-driven, you write the test first and then you fill in the code. In fact, and PyVita encourages that so much so that uh, Space Tyrant was written using test-driven development. So let's look at some examples. Uh, this is, can people read that font? Is that all right? Oh, no, that's less good. All right, so if we can see here the simplest game is just a blank screen. It doesn't do anything. So we'll move on to a more elaborate example. Uh, you import your, your classes, but you have your interact scripts. So if you click on the leak, it says, hello world, it's a leak. If you click on the guard, he goes, hold who's go there, who goes there. Then we have our sort of scaffolding where we build our scene and our set. So we create a scene with a background. We create an actor with a idle action. You know, we do the same for the leak and for the main player. Then we add them to the scene, set the camera, and we run it. And I look at that code, and I roll my eyes a bit, but we'll give it a go. All right, so you can see here that it's loaded up our scene and added our actors to the scene, including our leak. And PyVita's done a bit of magic already, where it's detected that the leak was an animation, and so it's animating it for us. But there's nothing much you can do, because you know, we didn't really see, we didn't really code much. So let's take it to the next step. If you're willing to use the smart layout that Py, uh, PyVita can use. You know, your actors in a directory, your fonts and, and everything in their own directory. You can replace all the scaffolding with a smart load function. So you don't have to use it, but I highly recommend it. So we check out a more elaborate script, well, elaborate in some ways. Uh, we've expanded our leak script so that when you click on the leak, it will crack, it will get bigger, the guard will spot it, walk over there, and then the game state changes so that you can move around. Uh, all that scaffolding has been replaced by this one call to smart load. And we've added a little exit button to the menu just to get, make it a little bit nicer on exiting. So we run that and see what happens. Well, you get a loading screen, for example. But here we have our script once again. We'll click on the leak. It cracks. Gets bigger. Guard spots it. He walks over, plugs it. And now you're free to walk around. It's a bit off the screen because of the resolution. Uh, and because there are multiple actions for the, the, that actor, the path planning algorithm kicks in, and you can and play around. And keeping in mind the constant feedback thing, I'll just show you a little feature of the engine, is there's an in-game editor. So designers can just make their changes and instantly see what's happening. So we'll exit that. So that's a basic game adventure game made in PyVita. Now, I mentioned earlier that it's test-driven development. And that's a very useful feature, especially with a point-and-click adventure game, which is very narrative-based. So we go back to that script we looked at uh, that we just ran and scroll down to the bottom. Our description of the game that we wrote earlier has been broken down into a series of steps. You know, you start in the foyer, oops, you start in the foyer, you interact with the leak, et cetera, and et cetera, et cetera. And we've seen the code for that, but there's a second half to the game that there is no code for, where you go inside the dome, destroy the machine. And that's missing. So when you do run the test runner, the game runs perfectly until it can't find the second scene, and it starts to throw errors. And that's when you can tell the game has gone off the rails. So it's quite useful in that regard. But it's not only useful for that. Once you've embedded the walkthrough into the code, you do get access to a lot of other things, not just test. You can also generate a human-readable walkthrough from the game automatically, which is very useful for a point-and-click adventure game, which is a nice little feature. Uh, it's also useful as a help system. You can track where someone is in the game by if they've tripped the next step in the walkthrough. But there is one mere culpa with this that happened to me while, uh, with Space Tyrant, and I only discovered it just before release is that when those tests all complete, you can guarantee that someone can play the game from start to finish if and only if they play it perfectly. If at any point they deviate from the walkthrough, uh, that's when you can get errors. And that's actually turned out to be the source of most problems. 
So the preferred PyVita walkthrough is you write your game, break it into step-by-step -step uh, directions, build the sets and the actors, so you hire artists or something like that, and then only then do you actually fill out the game scripts. Something else that I think uh, is a sign of quality and is very overlooked with game design is accessibility. Uh, I'm of the belief that people don't have accessibility issues, software has accessibility issues. There's a really great website called the Game Accessibility Guidelines that has about three dozen suggestions on how you can make your game more accessible. Simple things like making sure there are subtitles all the way up to making sure you can skip the cognitively challenging puzzles. Uh, I have a background in web design and e-commerce, and I think a lot of the suggestions would actually also apply to a website. Something else that I think is a sign of quality and is very underutilized at the moment is including the source with your game. Um, it's a selling point with a segment of the community. It assists with accessibility because people can customize the experience to their own needs. Uh, it make, gives the game a longer life as it gets, can be ported to platforms that don't exist yet. Uh, users can send you bug fixes, which is always lovely. And also it promotes that open ecosystem that we all you know, really love and support. Uh, so this is a good point to just reiterate that the game code is only a small part of the overall process of making and, and selling a game. Uh, some of the tools I use for making games, I use Google Drive, uh, Google Drive, whatever it's called now, to do the design. Space Tyrant was made using uh, Python 2.7 and Pygame. Uh, my next game is using Python 3.4 uh, and maybe Piglet. I'm experimenting with that at the moment. Uh, I've been trying to write Python 3 compatible code for a couple of years, so the switchover has been quite easy. You know, I was really dubious when they first announced Python 3 because they added brackets to, well, they converted uh, print from a statement to a, a function. And what attracted me to Python in the first place was how simple print hello world was. And so I feel like it was a ret retrograde step. But having used it for exclusively for three to six months now, uh, there is a real elegance to Python 3. So if you haven't made the switch yet, here's another vote from me for you to do so. I use GitHub for code repository. If you're not using a remote code repository, the peace of mind it brings is amazing. Uh, project management, I use Trello.com, which is a web service uh, where you have cards per task, uh, much better than email. Uh, most importantly, you have ownership of tasks, which is very important when you're planning a larger project. The game scripts, which is a small part. Packaging, I have a slide on that. For the website, I use uh, something like Amazon Web Services is quite good. And for the online sales, I use a service called BMT Micro. So packaging on Python, a binary for sale. You know, I think by design, they've made it difficult, but there are ways around it. Uh, on Windows, you can use game2xe.py uh, to compile it and then InnoSet to bundle it up. Py to app uh, and create DMG on Mac to create a distributable disk image. And on Linux, I have a source archive and a little install script that installs the dependencies like Pygame and that system-wide. I did debate whether it was OK to install things system-wide on someone's system, but uh, the Steam Linux client does the same thing, and I thought if Valve can get away with it, I've, I'll get away with it too. So I've got it down to one config script and three build scripts, so it's all right. It's not great. Something that you really should consider when you're making a game is having some method for updating it, or at least letting people know there's an update. Uh, you'll never launch 100% perfectly, so make sure you know, you've got some method for letting people know. Uh, your website and your trailer is so important. A lot of people leave it to the end, but from day one, you should be planning your trailer and maybe even your website. Uh, you know, at least initially, your trailer will sell more copies of your game than your game will. So it really deserves a lot of your time and effort. And you ask the same questions that you ask of your game. You know, is this entertaining? Is this quality? Is it interesting? Uh, you know, treat it like the first part of your game. So if you've made a fun game, make a fun website. If you've made a horror game, make a horror website. You want to sell your game, there are lots of ways to do it in the PC world. If you want to sell it direct, there's BMT Micro in the Humble Store. I use BMT Micro, no problems with it, it's pretty good. I'm thinking of switching to Humble Store mostly because the sale widget is on the same page as, as the game, and whereas BMT Micro takes you to a special page. And I feel that that may affect conversion rates, and you want every sale you can get. Something you can do is team up with other indie developers and come up with a bundle where you put you know, six games together, and then people pay what they want. And it sounds a bit counterintuitive, but it has been quite profitable for the people involved. There are also app stores for PC games. The three main ones are Dezura, Good Old Games, and Steam. But uh, of the three, only one really matters, and that's Steam. Uh, about 90% of people's sales come out through Steam. So you should focus on getting on that, really. And something else to remember about indie games is that they have a long tail. So when we think of blockbuster games and blockbuster films, they often, if they fail on the first, if they don't make money on the first weekend, people say they failed. But with indie games, 
It takes a while for them to percolate through the internet. And in the case of Mike's boyfriend, the space tyrant, it really took six months for the sales to start to pick up, and they've been quite consistent since. Something that happens when you've finally released your game is a thing called the death of the author, where you have no control over how people actually receive your game. And you can try your hardest to make an entertaining game, but if someone's had a bad, mo you know, a bad morning, or you know, their parents were killed by clowns, when they sit down to review your clown game, they'll give it a bad review. Uh, but you've just got to kind of learn to roll with that and let it go, because it's nothing personal. Uh, things that you should uh, be ready for are feedback from users and how you're going to deal with that. Journalists, uh, review copies, always have some on hand. And also try and get review copies out to reviewers at least two weeks before you launch, because a lot of reviewers like to have their review up on day one, so it's fresh for everyone involved. Of course, you'll get reviews, quote the good ones, and learn from the bad ones. Ignore the really, really bad ones. Uh, hero swag is something I like to do. You just send a copy of the game to someone that's inspired you, and more often than not, they send you a little thank you note, and then you've got a little connection to someone you like. Uh, something I had never heard of until I launched a game is this, there's this sort of genre of entertainment called Play This or Let's Play, where people play the game online on YouTube or Twitch for their followers to watch. And uh, I got a bit blindsided where I was on my way to a convention last year, and just as I was hopping on the plane, I got a little media alert from Google that some fellow had uploaded a playthrough of the game. And by the time I got off the plane an hour and a half later, 40,000 people had viewed it. And watching it, it, was, it did my head in a bit, because he was playing it as an oddity, because he, he was straight, you know, he wasn't interested in gay games, but it had sort of piqued his interest a bit. And so he wasn't playing it how I envisioned it being played, but you know, there is no right way to play a game. And it's you know, nice for people to play it. Uh, community politics is something you've got to be careful of. Um, I put Space Tyrant up on Steam Greenlight. So Steam Greenlight is this process where everyone on Steam gets a yes or no vote. Uh, so it's an ultimate democracy. So a game like Space Tyrant, which is you know, targeted for 5% of the population, it was never going to fare well. But the economics of it are too large to ignore, because if you get on Steam, it's a very, very good thing. Uh, but one of the things I, so I was ready for it to be sort of torn down. But what did surprise me was that when you insert a game into an ongoing community, it becomes a proxy for conversations they've been having for a long time. So one of the things the Steam Greenlight people are always talking about is what makes Steam different to other gaming websites. And then they use your game as a proxy for that. They don't mean anything by it. Reddit as well. Uh, just you know, be careful or else you get a whack, whack around the head. Uh, tangential media is something you uh, should focus on. Like The indie game press is very, very crowded. There's hundreds of games released a day. I think that's fair to say that. But there's a lot of other press where there's very few games come along. So I was very lucky in that I had the gay press to pick up on a gay game, because there's just not many of them. And then once it gets into these sort of tangential medias, accessibility media is a great one too. Once it's out there, it kind of goes sideways into the gaming press. So that's a really great way to get coverage. And once you start getting coverage, you get third party advocacy. And if you can get other people who you don't know talking about your game, that really, really makes your life a lot easier. So you'll get feedback. Here's uh, you know, a lot of feedback I got. I don't know how much time I've got left, but maybe the last one's just indicative of the whole thing, really. I swear this isn't made up. <laughs> it's true. It reads to me made up, but I like it anyway. It's a whole lot of fun. As a gay guy, this is the game I've wanted to play all my life. Thank you, Brian. Uh, of course, you'll get negative feedback. Uh, well, I got negative feedback. I'm a particular fan of the spelling of vomit. Uh, but it is what it is. And you know, it's just, after a while, it just becomes noise in a way. Uh, so with the press, it's important with your game to sort of embed some stories in it for the press to pick up on. So I made sure I had uh, you know, a gay story to tell to the gay press, an Australian story to tell to the, to the Australian press and a, a gaming story to tell to the gaming press, even though I knew the gaming press probably were going to be a hard sell. Uh, and that worked out quite well. But one thing I did learn about dealing with the press, especially the gaming press, is, this, oh, uh, is that only gamers are interested in games. So getting non-gamers to talk about your game is very, very hard. And I miscalculated a bit in that uh, my, when I made the game, I made it for people who don't really play games very often. Uh, it turns out they don't really play games very often. Uh, the people that play games are gamers. So if you're going to make a game, make it for gamers. Uh, yes, something else I learned the hard way. Oh, is that? 
Sure. Well, the $10 price point, very important. Uh, you know, that don't undersell your work, but when you're planning your work, you know, do the size, put in the effort for that $10 price point. And I guess the last thing that I, I learned the hard way was that great ideas become good ideas, become boring ideas. Uh, games are a marathon, not a, not a sprint. And so something that seems like a great moment, you, you have a light bulb moment, uh, you're going to be with that idea for you know, 18 months, two years. So you really want to battle test it early on. Uh, gee, what else has happened? Well, I'm making another game. There you go. Escape from Pleasure Planet. Uh, and that's what I'm doing in the future. So maybe we'll wrap it up there. If you want to know more about it, feel free to come up and ask. And the slides are online. Yeah. Oh, I'll jump straight to the. There we go. Yeah. Sure. So if anyone would like uh, to ask a question, there's a microphone right here in front. So we got a, uh, two, three minutes left. So it's on. Oh, there we go. Okay. Um, uh, I really liked your talk. Um, I was wondering, um, did you do all of the like art and sound yourself, and what tools did you use to do that? Uh, so I have an artist in San Diego, a fellow called Joe Phillips, and he's quite a famous gay artist. Uh, he worked for DC and Dark Comics in the 90s. And so I was very, very lucky. In fact, probably one of the greatest days of my life was when he said yes, because I spent years going, you know, his art style would really suit this type of game. And then one day I just thought, you know what, I'll just ask him. And he said yes. So he kind of made it work, really. Hmm. But I do some of the animation, and of course I use GIMP and Inkscape. Yeah. yeah. Thanks. Hi. So I'm very interested in uh, actually distributing the game, uh, making the binaries. And you mentioned you plan to use Python 3 next time. So do you already have any plans for? Uh, making, making the binaries for that because Py2XN doesn't work with Python 3. C, uh, the Py installer doesn't work with Python 3. Do you have? Uh, what doesn't, sorry, what doesn't work with? Py2XN doesn't work with Python 3. Yeah. Oh, uh, so that's why I'm switching over to Piglet, uh, which is another graphics library. Uh, but I mean Py2XN. Uh, the oh, oh, right, right, right. Yeah, hopefully we'll port it. So we're looking into that. Okay. It's, yeah. Hmm. Thanks. Hi there. Hi. Um, I guess it's a traditional business plan you have for this game, that is you sell it on Steam or uh, things like this. Have you thought about free-to-play or other micro, uh, micro uh, payment system? Well, you know, I did have a thing about the price point. Um, basically, I, I looked at it as a project that is like a gay film or a gay novel. So it's a boutique product for a boutique audience. And initially, I never thought that its competitors were other computer games. I thought its competitors were you know, a box set of you know, Queer as Folk or you know, an Amistad Morpin book. And so that was really the mentality of it. So with something like Free Play and you know, like a cheaper version on the iPhone or Android, I'm not particularly interested in going that because it's such a small market. So you've got to kind of, I really want to try and keep the price point up a little bit. Hmm. Uh, thanks for the talk. It's great. I'm glad I finally got to see it live. Hmm. Um, so your art story is kind of unique in that you contacted the artist directly. Do you have any advice, though, for people creating games, how they might go about finding artists? Well, so I actually have two artists. I have the character artist and the background artist. And I got the background artist through DeviantArt. And you know, it's such an underutilized resource. I don't think they know what they've got there, really. Uh, you just go, there's thousands of artists, mostly hobbyists, but they're so professional about it. You just find an art style that you like and send them a few emails. So it took, I think, four or five goes to find a background artist who was interested. Um, and I went through a couple, so they weren't the first artist. But uh, you know, for the budget for indie game developers, things like DeviantArt are really great. But pay, pay them. You know, they're, they're very cheap. Thank you very much. Yeah, well, thank you very much. Move.